Hello everybody, this is Mina Aza and you are watching the Surgical Whiteboard. Today we will continue talking about the stomach. We will talk about the peptic ulcer disease, which is a very common condition affecting the gastric and the duodenal mucosa. It ranges from a mild inflammation like mild gastritis or duodenitis to a deep ulcer causing bleeding or perforation. The gastric mucosa is affected with several protective and destructive factors. Healthy mucosa is capable of rapid regeneration due to its rich blood supply. It also secretes a mucus layer that act as a barrier against the destructive effect of HCL. On the other hand, the destructive factors are the gastric juice itself containing HCL and protein digestive enzymes like pepsinogen, infections such as Helicobacter pylori, and mechanical fraction against swallowed foreign bodies. Any increase in the destructive factors or decrease in the protective factors distorts the balance between them and lead to the appearance of peptic ulcers. For example, loss of healthy mucosa capable for rapid regeneration like in cases of atrophic gastritis, loss of active mucus secretion due to suppression of prostaglandins by intake of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, loss of rich blood supply in cases of shock, Due to the visceral vasoconstriction, it shifts the blood away from the visceral area, leading to stress ulcers, and increasing the destructive factors, such as an increase in the HCL secretion due to increased vagal tone by stress, which is one of the most common causes of peptic ulcers. Increasing HCL and digestive enzymes due to abnormal secretion of gastrin hormone in cases of Zollinger Ellison syndrome, infection with Helicobacter pylori and the erosive mechanical effect of swallowed foreign bodies, especially in children. Now we will talk about the most common sites of peptic ulcers. The antrum of the stomach and the lesser curvature is known to be the, one of the most common sites of peptic ulcer and was traditionally been named as the ulcer bearing area. Also ulcers are common in the peripyloic area in which the presence of two opposing ulcers is not uncommon. This is named as guessing ulcers. Another common site is the first part of the duodenum, which is known for its massive complications like bleeding and perforation. Here I would like to add a side note about the Mallory Weiss syndrome, which is an upper gastrointestinal bleeding following massive vomiting due to superficial mucosal tears in the gastroesophageal junction. It's usually uncomplicated and self-limiting. Now we will move to the clinical pictures and complications of peptic ulcer disease. The first prominent uh, feature of the clinical picture of peptic ulcer disease is the severe epigastric pain and tenderness, which is sometimes described to be reflected to the back. This is similar to the nature of the pain of the acute pancreatitis, which must be excluded in these cases. But when accompanied with a complete picture of acute abdomen, like rigidity and rebound tenderness, one must think of a perforated peptic ulcer. This can be easily confirmed or excluded using a normal um, uh, erect X-ray, where the presence of air under diaphragm is a sure sign of a viscous perforation and an absolute operative indication. Hematemesis or upper gastrointestinal bleeding. Although it's considered to be one of the complications, it's not uncommon to be the first presentation in an otherwise silent peptic ulcer. A large amount of a fresh blood in vomiting may indicate the presence of arterial bleeding, which must be treated more quickly. A more common manifestation of upper gastrointestinal bleeding is the presence of melena, in which a relatively small amount of blood passing through the gastrointestinal tract, staining the stool plaque due to the presence of acid hematine, which is a degradation product of hemoglobin. Now let's talk about the management. An uncomplicated peptic ulcer is usually managed with proton pump inhibitors and helicobacter pylori eradication if present. But a patient with a bleeding peptic ulcer must be resuscitated in the first place with fluid therapy and close monitoring of vital signs. After hemodynamic stability reached, upper GIT endoscopy is the gold standard as it is considered to be a diagnostic and therapeutic maneuver. Forest classification is considered to be one of the widely used uh, classification or scales to describe the endoscopic finding in cases of gastrointestinal bleeding. 
Class 1 of the first classification represents the acute hemorrhage, in which active bleeding is clearly seen by the endoscopist. It's further divided to class 1A and 1B, in which 1A is acute arterial bleeding, in which a spurtic artery is seen. Class 1B is also active bleeding, but from a venous source, in which oozing bleeding is seen. Class 2 represents a recent bleeding. Here an active source is not seen. Instead, the endoscopist can see evidence of a recent bleeding, like a visible vascular stump on the floor of the peptic ulcer. This is stage 2a. In a stage 2b, the endoscopist can see a blood clot on the floor of a recent blood ulcer. And the last evidence of a recent bleeding is a stage 2c in which altered hemoglobin or black hematine is seen on top of the ulcer. The third class of the forest classification represents the cases without recent or active bleeding, in which only the mucosal lesion is seen. Therapeutic endoscopic maneuvers include the following. Injection of adrenaline into and around the bleeding vessels leads to rapid vasoconstriction and control of the bleeding in about 90% of cases. The second option is sclerotherapy, for example, ethanolamine injection or the application of fibrin glue. Thermal coagulation is also possible using a multipolar coagulator or laser argon beamer. And lastly, application of mechanical clips is very useful in cases of vascular bleeding. After bleeding control, the patient is usually transferred to the intensive care unit, in which close monitoring is carried out. Here, the risk of free bleeding must be estimated, and accordingly, further endoscopic follow-up or surgery is planned. One of the useful tools to estimate the risk of free bleeding is the ROCAL score, in which each category is assigned a value from 0 to 3 points. Number 1, the age of the patient at the admission, in which the best prognosis in patient before 60 years old. The second category is the presence of comorbidities in which heart diseases are assigned two points. Renal failure, liver failure and metastatic cancer are assigned three points with the worst prognosis. The cause of the bleeding is the third category. The best prognosis is assigned to malary vice syndrome with zero points and followed by benign ulcers assigned one point and malignant ulcers assigns two points with the worst prognosis. The fourth category is the vital signs on admission. Normal vital signs are assigned zero points, while tachycardia with more than 100 beats per minute assigned one point and complete picture of shock with hypotension in which systolic blood pressure below 100 millimeter mercury assigned two points. The last category of the score is the endoscopic findings, where the presence of active bleeding forced 1 or recent bleeding forced 2 are assigned 2 points. The sum of all the previous 5 categories is assigned a number between 0 and 11. Local score below 3 is considered to be a good prognosis and minor risk of free bleeding. A score between 3 and 8 is considered a significant risk of free bleeding and a score between 8 and 11 is a major risk of free bleeding. Surgical treatment is indicated in cases of massive bleeding in which endoscopic management has failed or in cases of free bleeding. Here we must differentiate between the cases of duodenal ulcer and gastric ulcers. In cases of duodenal ulcers, a longitudinal duodenotomy should be performed then the bleeding source should be determined. The next step is controlling the bleeding using underrunning sutures. Massive duodenal bleeding is usually due to erosion of the posterior wall of the duodenum and injury of the gastrodudenal artery. It is usually a massive bleeding that should be surgically treated. In cases of gastric ulcers, the preferred treatment is excision of the ulcer itself, usually using distal gastrectomy and pathological analysis of the specimen to exclude malignancies. An exception of this concept is a de la Foy ulcer. It represents a, a rare cause of gastrointestinal bleeding, only about 1-2%. to 2 It is an abnormally white-calibered blood vessel, but not an aneurysm, running under the gastric mucosa. 
in the submucosal space. Any minor erosion of this area will lead to a massive arterial bleeding. The treatment of choice when found is uh, underrunning sutures, because in this case the mucosa is normal. Now we will talk about the major types of distal or partial gastrectomies. The two main types of distal gastrectomies are called the pillows 1 and pillows 2 operations. They share the same principle of resection, in which about 50 to 75% of the stomach is resected. The main difference lies in the reconstruction strategy, which is in the case of pillows 1 operation through gastrodidonostomy, in which the remaining part of the proximal stomach is connected to the duodenal stump. On the other hand, in cases of pillows 2 operation, the reconstruction is achieved through to a gastrogenostomy. Here, the proximal gastric part is connected to the first jejunal loop, leaving the duodenal stump as a blind loop. The gastrogenostomy itself has many variations, and all of them are accepted strategy of reconstruction after a distal gastric resection. The first two variations are according to the peristaltic movement of the small intestine. When the first decisional loop is connected to the proximal part of the stomach in the same direction of its peristaltic movement, it's called isoperistaltic. Otherwise, it could be connected against the peristaltic movement and it's called antiperistaltic gastrogenostomy. Another classification depends on the position of the jejunal loop uh, against the transverse colon. When it passes in front of the transverse colon, it's called anticholic gastrogenostomy. But when the jejunal loop passes behind the transverse colon through the mesentery, it's called a retrocholic gastrogenostomy. According to the size of the stoma, a large stoma covering the whole length of the section margin of the stomach is called a polyanastomosis. While a smaller size stoma about three fingers wide is called a Hofmeister's anastomosis. According to the shape of the anastomosis, there is a simple loop anastomosis, which is the classic pillows to reconstruction, and an omega shaped loop in which an anterior enterostomy is constructed between the afferent and the efferent loops of the anastomosis. The third variation, according to the shape, is the row on y anastomosis, in which the first jejunal loop is splitted, its distal limb is connected to the stomach as an efferent loop, and its proximal limb is connected to the distal limb uh, approximately 45 cm below the gastrogenost. But what is the benefit of performing such a complex anastomosis? First of all, let's examine the normal loop anastomosis. The afferent loop carries the bile and the pancreatic secretion towards the anastomosis. This may lead to a biliary gastritis, which is a, a severe form of gastritis refractory to treatment. The idea behind the row on y anastomosis is diverting this erosive biliary and pancreatic secretion away from the stomach. They are carried by the afferent loop and meet the efferent loop 45 cm below the anastomosis. Now we will move to the management of a perforated peptic ulcer. The first part of the duodenum is a common site for perforated peptic ulcer. Usually the ulcer is on the anterior wall of the first part of the duodenum. If it is a small ulcer, less than 2 cm, the treatment of choice is clothing the perforation with two or three sutures over an omental patch. Less common is the perforation of the posterior wall of the duodenum in which a massive bleeding is added due to uh, erosion of the gastrodenal artery. A large ulcer, more than 2 cm, is treated with two options. The first option is diversion of the gastric juice away from the uh, duodenum and performing a pillow to a gastrectomy. The second option is with massive ulceration, in which the duodenal wall is beyond any repair attempt. Here the treatment of choice is performing a controlled fistula, in which a T-tube or a Foley catheter, Foley balloon catheter, is inserted inside the duodenum and the rest of the duodenal wall is adapted around it with suture. Definitive surgery should be tried later when the peritonitis subsides. Now we will talk about perforated gastric ulcers. A small perforated gastric ulcer should be taken as an excisional biopsy to exclude malignancy and examine for H. pylori. Then the ulcer is sutured. The treatment of a choice for a larger gastric ulcer is distal gastrectomy with pillows 2. As malignancy cannot be excluded before the pathological findings, it's uh, always not advised to perform a pillows 1 operation. The last section of our lesson today 
is uh, the management of the chronic uh, complications of peptic ulcer, which is uh, the pyloric stenosis. There are three main options to treat a pyloric stenosis. The first is an mycolytic uh, pyloroplasty, in which the pyloric muscle fibers are cut longitudinally and then uh, reconstructed or closed transversely, which lead to permanent structure of the pyloric uh, sphincter. The second option is Finney's pyloroplasty, in which the prepyloric space and the first part of the duodenum are connected together to widen the pyloric foramen. And the third and the last option is diverting the uh, gastric content uh, through a juxtapyloric posterior wall, uh, gastrogenostomy. Mm -hmm.